before the Apollo program, the moon was thought to be a barren planet devoid of life. The lunar surface is subjected to intense radiation from the sun. There is only the barest suggestion of an atmosphere. At night, surface temperatures plunge to 250 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. During the day, they rise to 250 degrees above. Such harsh conditions are not favorable to life, yet we couldn't be sure. We know that life on Earth often thrives in surprisingly hostile conditions. It was just possible that the lunar materials contain life forms that could invade Earth's ecological system and cause devastating harm. To guard against such an eventuality, we established elaborate procedures and facilities to quarantine the lunar material. We undertook major studies to learn what effect lunar materials might have on Earth's organisms. One of these focused on the plant life of Earth and was carried out jointly by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the Department of Agriculture. We conducted the studies at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, Texas, both in a special support facility and in the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. One of the major series of tests dealt with tissue cultures which are clumps of cells rather than organized tissues. One type is a root tissue culture. The technician takes a small piece of a previously sterilized root and cuts it into sections. The small root piece will be placed on a medium which is good for growing cells. The medium contains minerals as well as an auxin or a natural growth stimulator. The auxin also keeps the cells in an undifferentiated state. The proliferation of the individual cells takes place from the cut surface of the root. The jars are capped with a sterile plastic film and are placed in incubators for some time before testing. From one to four months is needed for proliferation of the cells to occur, the exact time depending on the plant species and its growth rate. The incubators provide a source of light as well as temperature control for the young cultures. Meanwhile, a series of large chambers are prepared for growing young seedlings in a sterile environment. Here, a chamber is being tested for leaks. This is done by filling the chamber with Freon, then measuring for leak rates exceeding 400 of an ounce per year. The movement of the needle indicates a leak which must be repaired before proceeding. Once the chamber is gas tight, a weighed amount of paraformaldehyde is added on a hot surface and vaporized. This kills all germs on all surfaces within the chamber. Paraformaldehyde is used because it does not cause rusting or degradation of containers or of the chamber itself. Notice the deposition of paraformaldehyde on the surfaces of the chamber. In addition to disinfecting the chambers, we also disinfect plant seeds. The technician is treating seeds with a hypochlorite or Clorox solution which contains 5,000 parts per million available chlorine. The seeds are washed for about five minutes and then rinsed thoroughly with sterile water. Rinsing is essential to remove traces of the chlorine.
The seeds are then placed in a nutrient broth or an equivalent semi-solid medium. Each seed is transferred with sterile forceps to the jar. The jar is then covered and incubated in a chamber. The jars are carefully examined at daily intervals throughout the testing period, both to follow the germination rate and to discover any contamination. Again, the incubators have light as well as temperature controls to allow plant growth. If the seedling has been shown to be free of microbial contamination during the germination process, it is transferred with a sterile forcep or spatula to a wood pulp product known commercially as BR8. The BR8 is a very excellent substrate for plant growth and it can be readily sterilized for use in the laboratory. Jars containing young plants are covered with tin foil to preserve the sterility of external surfaces. technician uses a sterile glove to remove the tin foil. She places a small jar within a quart mason jar previously sterilized. Every effort is made to maintain complete sterility on all surfaces within the large jar. A small amount of nutrient broth is placed between the walls of the inner and outer jar. The broth encourages growth and thus permits detection of any microbial contamination. The quart jars are capped with polypropylene for incubation once again in growth chambers. The jars provide an isolator for individual seedlings during the time they are becoming established. In the incubators, the young plants are grown at 73 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit under a lighting similar to that found in nature. In our larger chambers, the lids of jars can be removed and the plants examined. Plants can be maintained within a separate isolator for a week or longer, the time depending on the species and its growth rate. The quarantine time allows us to detect contamination before it spreads from one individual plant to all the others. This particular plant is a peanut. We take extensive precautions each week to assure that the chamber itself is maintained in a sterile condition. Rubber gloves are used to isolate workers from the chamber environment. To check for contamination, a technician moistens a cotton swab in sterile water or in a saline, that is, a salt solution. He swabs any given point within the chamber, collecting microbes which might be present. He places the swabs in a nutrient broth or other growth medium to check for any bacteria or fungi. Accurate records are kept and the results are recorded. By this technique, a large number of plant containers and chamber points can be checked quite readily. If a contaminant appears within a jar, it usually causes discoloration or darkening of the nutrient broth. There also might be a deterioration of the plant. This young cucumber plant, for instance, is showing a yellowing of its cotyledon or first leaves because of a bacterial contamination or infection. The techniques we have developed for handling and studying plants under quarantine are going to have wide application in agriculture research.
Once the plants have reached the proper stage, we prepare to transfer them from our support facility to the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. A rather elaborate procedure is involved. First, the technician inspects each jar for the presence of microbes. Once he is certain that the contents are clean, he replaces the polypropylene cap with a mason jar lid. This acts as an airtight seal for movement of the plants. Contaminated plants are simply discarded. Moving the plants requires the cooperation of a number of personnel. When a chamber is opened, the positive pressure is immediately released. The gloves collapse. The technicians can then remove the plants. If possible, the plants must be transferred to the Lunar Receiving Laboratory before lunar materials arrive and the sample operations area is placed in quarantine. This allows free movement of the plants between the buildings. Once lunar materials have been introduced into the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, no movement of materials or supplies can take place openly through the corridors. Only with elaborate precautions of moving through a series of ultraviolet airlocks can the plants be taken to the chambers. Entrance to the plant chambers is through an autoclave which contains two doors. One door is open only when the other door is closed. The plant jars are placed within the autoclave and formaldehyde gas is again used to sterilize the surfaces. This allows movement of biological materials from one sterile chamber to another. Finally, with everything set, the first of the boxes containing lunar materials arrives following a mission. The boxes are unpacked in a sterile nitrogen cabinet line. This unpacking comprises an elaborate series of steps aimed at cataloging and documenting the contents of each rock box. In this case, a bag containing lunar soil is being examined. A portion of the soil is being transferred into a bolt top can. Most of the materials tested by the botanical laboratory were lunar surface soils or those materials small enough to pass through a one centimeter mesh sieve. The material that has passed through the sieve is examined both for its chemical and geological composition. Using a microscope to study lunar particles, for instance, one can see differences in mineral composition made apparent with the aid of polarized light. As the light is rotated, the different minerals reflect the light according to their chemical composition. Close inspection is also made for any form of life that might be evident. After geologists have processed the samples, portions are given to our botanical lab. They are distributed in small vials inside a sterile nitrogen environment. These vials are packed in bolt top cans which are transferred through a disinfectant solution into the biological enclosures used to test the plant. The contents of each vial will be placed on a plant or on tissue cultures. 
there is only about one one hundredth of an ounce per vial. One of the most sensitive means for detecting soil-borne microbes is the seed germination test. The lunar soil sample is placed on top of seeds which have been placed in a thin chamber. The distribution of soil in this way enables us to spread a small portion over a large area. The seeds, the BR8, and the lunar soil are then watered. Within 48 hours, germination occurs for most species. Other tests are initiated in which lunar material is placed in contact with growing seedlings. This particular melon, for instance, was treated by placing one one hundredth of an ounce of lunar material at the base of the plant. Watering will ensure that the lunar material contacts the young growing root tips and root hairs. A young cabbage plant is treated in a similar manner. Other plants, including lower forms such as ferns and liverworts, are likewise treated by sprinkling the lunar dust over their surface. This liverwort is growing in a nutrient solution containing various mineral salts. Another way to ensure that lunar material contacts the plant cells is to rub the leaf surface with a suspension of lunar material in either phosphate solution or water. By using a glass spatula and holding the leaf very carefully, the cells of the epidermal or surface layer can be gently wounded. This assures that some of the smaller particulate matter enters the cells themselves. This test is often used for detecting plant viruses. Excessive rubbing of the leaves kills them as would be indicated by immediate wilt. Here we have the leaves of a young cantaloupe plant being rubbed with the suspension. While these operations are proceeding in the seedling cabinets, other personnel are preparing suspensions of lunar material in water for treating algae or algal cells. The suspension is made in a mineral medium known to promote the growth of a variety of algae. The small amount of lunar material is placed within the jar. After the suspension is made, it is placed on the surface of a growing culture. In this instance, a green slime growing over the surface of the medium. The medium within the jar is slanted to provide a broader growing area. By shaking the suspended lunar material with the algal cell culture, both the cells and the lunar material come into contact. This assures thorough treatment. Once the suspension is made, it is returned to the flask and used as a source culture or an inoculum for a variety of other tests. The parent culture as well as the suspension culture are saved so that any trace of lunar material can be recovered. In a like manner, tissue cultures are treated by sprinkling with a small amount of lunar material. This is a very stringent test for both contact inhibition and toxicity to the plant cells. This is a pine tissue culture treated with lunar material from the Apollo 12 mission. For any given lunar mission, the process of treating plants with lunar materials continues until over 1,300 different cultures are challenged. The tissue cultures number over 320 and include some eight types of plant tissue, for example, rice, corn, pine, tobacco, sunflower, and soybean. In the plant tissues, as well as the algae, 
The same type of plastic film is used as a barrier between the sterile system and the cabinet system. Careful records are taken of all phases of both the treatment and changes brought about by the treatment. Being sprinkled here is a primitive type plant called lycopodium or club moss. This is a younger culture of club moss in which we see the smaller clumps of tissue. It is typical of the lunar material to clump as it hits the surface. Such tissues are checked at weekly intervals. At the termination of the experiment, they are examined and analyzed. In the course of our observation, we saw that a culture of red algae began to grow a short time after treatment with lunar material, exhibiting no inhibition whatever. Likewise, the stock culture which remained after treating the medium allowed growth, a red algae on the left and a green algae on the right. The club moss culture, which was shown as a light green young culture, has grown luxuriantly in the presence of lunar material. Traces of the material are evident on the surface of the medium. A fern culture treated three weeks previously has grown luxuriantly. The roots have penetrated the medium. The young fern leaves are bursting out of the top of the jar. In this instance, the lush green growth is found in plants treated with either terrestrial or lunar material. Three or four weeks after treatment, the diatom appeared as a brownish slime growing over the black lunar material. There is no evidence of inhibition. After two weeks, the seed germination in the presence of lunar material indicates no deleterious effects. Indeed, they appear to be doing better than untreated plants. Likewise, the plant seedlings such as the cabbage and the radish seedlings, which were sprinkled with lunar material, appear to be very healthy. No difference is noted between treated and untreated radishes. As the period of observation continues, generally for about 50 days, many plants such as the cantaloupe come into flower. The appearance of normal flowers is further evidence that the lunar material does not contain any harmful agents. This young wheat plant has grown well in spite of the fact that the lunar material has diffused down within the BR8 and contacted the root system. Careful documentation of all treated plants in comparison with untreated plants is made by photography. Here we have an untreated corn tissue culture on the left and a treated culture on the right. The roots of the treated culture have proliferated. This is a treated tobacco tissue culture which is green after a considerable period of time. The untreated culture has died or turned tan. On the left, a treated fern culture has become intensely green in the center. On the right, an untreated culture has taken on a tannish appearance. The effect on the liverwort was quite striking. In the top row of jars, Treated plants have intensified in color and accelerated in growth. The process of observation is followed up by histological or cellular studies. A small piece of each plant treated with the lunar material is removed from the culture with the lunar material attached.
it is placed in a killing and fixing solution called glutaraldehyde. This aldehyde solution ensures that any microbes present on the tissues will be fixed and killed prior to their removal from the cabinet system. Further, it fixes the protein elements and the other essential features of the cells. They can then be processed by embedding in paraffin or plastic. Once embedded, thin sections of the materials can be placed on small grids. They can then be inserted into an electron microscope. The tissues can be examined at magnifications up to 100,000 diameters. The appearance of the tissues is recorded in a form called electron micrographs. Various components of the cells, such as these vesicular or membrane elements, are compared between treated and untreated cultures. The appearance of unusual formations in the plastids or food manufacturing systems of plants is also recorded. This is a large white starch grain embedded within a plastid. Also, we notice an unusual shaped cell organelle or component appearing like a dumbbell-shaped organelle. In addition to studies immediately following lunar flights, we have also run long-term investigations, usually in chambers designed to minimize microbial contamination. Our plants are often held and observed for one to three months beyond the time we remove them from the lunar receiving laboratory. Many plants produce flowers and fruits during this period of time, and occasionally we collect seed and start a second generation plant. Now what can we say of the meaning of our studies? What of their implications? First, in meeting our original objective, we have shown that the plant life on Earth is in no way endangered by lunar materials. Perhaps more importantly in the long run, we have developed new and better methods to isolate and grow plants under germ-free conditions. These methods can be readily adapted to controlling and studying plant diseases. Of equal importance, we are learning more about plant nutrition. We are beginning to understand, for instance, how plants can grow on the face of almost solid rock. The full meaning is not yet clear, but it seems possible that our findings in nutrition can be used to significantly increase crop yields. Thus what began as an investigation of a bit of matter from a barren planet we call the moon has led to developments and discoveries of considerable importance to that lush green planet we call home.